pray for me today, even as I break the bread of life today, uh, that I may have the right set of mind to be able to get through it, and also for all of us to be able to receive God's words, and that I would speak it in the spirit of love and the way that God would have this word come across to you, and even to me, because it's it's his living word. He's able to speak to this preacher as he's speaking to the audience, right? Um, I, I like to kind of have an icebreaker, a story that kind of helps us uh, set our minds toward what we're going to be talking about. The title of my sermon today, for those of you who are looking for a title, it's simply the, the, the name Gazing. The title of the sermon is Gazing. Um, when you think about gazing, you think about someone looking at something very intently, almost like in a, in a, in a way that uh, they can't simply get their eyes off, they're mesmerized by a particular thing or situation. The one situation I, that stands very clearly in my mind was when I was in my first year of high school and uh, we would take the bus to school. My sisters were in elementary school, different elementary school. But of course, like I've come to learn when we have a child in the home, when it's time to go to school in the morning, somehow someone takes too long in the bathroom, someone's brushing their teeth, someone hasn't woken up on time, uh, hasn't eaten their breakfast and, the, and they need to be out of the house in five minutes. And that used to happen during our day. And, and, and you only had so many buses. And to walk, to have to get to the, about a quarter of a mile to get to the bus stop, you had to run out. And um, I remember on one particular day, and it happened on many occasions, we ran outside, went through the gate, and we were out on the little road that led to our, to our home. And uh, now you could see other people walking along that footpath. It trailed down into a kind of like a, a, a little valley and then rose up uh, to, towards uh, the main road where we would catch our bus. And as I was walking out, I, I saw this figure. He was coming up and he, I had seen him many times and I, I knew who he was, but he was one of those people who never spoke much. He had very broad shoulders. He was probably in his 50s. He had a bow and arrow uh, strapped along his, 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 his back. Uh, and uh, he had uh, something like, uh, like a, a club. Uh, you see back in uh, places like Kenya and Africa, if you work security at night, they don't give you a baton or let's say for instance, you can't ca carry a firearm, at least not in a village setting when you're taking care of someone's property over the, at nighttime. So you have those kind of weapons. So he was intimidating to say the least because he was very stoic, very quiet. So I saw him. So we quickly ran past him uh, and we were hurrying on to the bus stop to get to the, uh, to the bus uh, so that the bus would not leave us and we would be on time for school. I was a teenager, barely 14 years old. So as I ran, as I looked, you know, as I ran, something told me, you know, keep looking and you look back. So I, I glanced back after uh, about 10 feet away from him and, and I, I, I saw him stop. He was turned in the opposite direction from which he was going and he was looking towards us and he was staring. And so I looked, I looked and I thought, oh, that looks kind of eerie. And so I kept running and my sisters were running behind me and I was kind of waiting up on them because they were a little slower. And then I got to the top of the hill and I thought, well, let me just look back. I wonder if he stopped staring. And he was still staring. And I kind of thought, oh my goodness, this guy is just gazing at us. What's, what's, what's up with that? So I, you know, then I thought, well, he didn't do anything. So let's go to school. And I didn't really think about it. Until one time I ran into him at a friend's house and he was sitting in one of the couches there, and he was holding a newspaper upside down. And I was like wondering, why is this man, why does this man uh, stare at school children going to school, 
all the time. And he would do that. We started realizing it was something that he, he did all the time. He stared at school children as they went to school. Now, for that to happen in America today, you would think, ooh, that, that sounds like a very strange person. He might be up to no good. But uh, sooner than later, so, so uh, you know, later uh, when I talked to my friend, I said, man, that guy's reading the newspaper upside down. I, I was able to whisper to him, why, why? You know, that guy's kind of strange. Then he told me, you know, this guy, he can't read. And then it finally dawned on me when he told me that. The reason why he stares at school children is because he wishes that he could read. He had the opportunity to go to school and read and understand. So in his mind, he's playing that tape. Like, wow, they're going to get on a bus. They're going to go to school. Someone's going to teach them how to read and write. I'll never get that chance. And he, after that, I, I always said hello to him because I kind of got it. Okay, this guy, he means no evil. It's just that he just feels like he missed out on opportunity. So what would he do? He would gaze. I'm pretty sure that in our lives, we, we've met people like that, that gaze at things that either we have or kind of in their minds, they kind of dwell on it. Uh, and maybe we do also gaze at things that we think are important to us. And so I, I, today's sermon is, is exploring different people in the Bible and what their gaze was, what they really uh, confounded them and what they spend a lot of time on and what the results were and, and what are the lessons found in those stories. So we'll, we'll start uh, off with another word of prayer. It won't take long, just a little bit, and then we'll get into the sermon. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for giving us another opportunity and even myself to be able to speak to your people. This format is a little strange because we are used to uh, getting the response of many and being able to be with people in one place and to be able to kind of you know, feed off uh, the presence of people and, and their reactions. So Father, we, I pray, Father, for your strength feel kind of weak today, and but uh, uh, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would, would guide and that we would be able to uh, receive the words, uh, your words clearly, and, and that our lives would be impacted, all of us, myself and the hearers. I pray for your strength in the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. So if you're talking about gazing, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't go back to the book of Genesis because that's really the beginning. Uh, and the uh, first guy, case study, if I can put it that way, is, um, is Genesis chapter six. If you can turn your Bibles there, I've got to remember to give you time to get there. Uh, you find there in the book of Genesis chapter six, um, the, the Bible reads and says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. It's interesting why it says daughters and not sons and daughters. But it says, you know, it's trying to give a story. This is what's going on. That the sons of God, I, I, sometimes I like to read slowly so that you can get the story gently. When we read too fast, the scriptures, even when you're doing your morning devotions, read slowly. It's not how much you read, it's how much you retain and how much you get, right? That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Notice there's two subjects there. The sons of God and the daughters of men. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Hmm. And then it says, I'm going to read something here, and then we'll go, to, we'll go back and, and start ex extracting the information from it. Then it says, there were giants on the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God, there goes the name again, the title of this group of people, where the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. They bare children to them and became mighty men which were of old. 
men of renown. And I'm very careful on this particular scripture because many have twisted it to their own end. Um, when God talks about the sons of God, the sons of God, he is not talking about angels. Some people like to say they're angels that came in to, to be children born of men and women and, and then children were born out of that. I've heard uh, one denomination call them stump name and, and they say this was a group of people that were angels. And, but Jesus did say one thing that's very particular that completely repudiates what that is trying to suggest because he, he said that in the new world, in the new world, when, when there's the, after the resurrection, uh, that uh, men will become like angels, not given in marriage or no, no, no longer having mar marital relations. That means the angels have a different type of nature. You can't mix the two. He said, you know, that's what Jesus said. You cannot mix the two. Uh, another thing is that you, you've got to understand that this, in order to understand the context of this scripture, right? Notice this. In order to understand the context of this scripture, you need to go back to Genesis chapter 4. Because this term is used here. Verse 26. It's one page over. It would be nice to see a lot of faces because in the absence of a lack of congregation, it's very encouraging to see faces. Otherwise, it looks like I'm looking at five faces and uh, a sea of names. Just encouraging. You don't have to, but I would that it would be it would be nice so uh, uh genesis chapter 4 verses 26 and to seth to him also there was born a son and his name was enos then began then began man to call upon the name of the lord i like the suggestion below below the king james to say what that means it says they started calling themselves by the name of the Lord. So if you are being called, you're calling yourself, I am the son of Enos, and then all of a sudden you decide, hey, you know what? Uh, Seth has been teaching us. And by the way, for those of you who've been studying the Bible, you know that Seth was the uh, third son to Adam, and he was, one, he was the one that started restoring what uh, Abel Abel was. He started becoming more godly and he started talking about God. And, and as a result, his own son, Enoch, uh, you know, was, was drawn to God. And so what that mean, simply means, if we can put it simply, is that if you are considering yourself a son of Enoch, you're, you're going to say, hey, you know what? I'm a son of God because I believe in God. That's where the term came, comes from. When you go to chapter six and you see the sons of God. Um, Adam was the son of God, right? Because he was made of the hands of God. But after Cain sinned, people kind of did their own thing for a little bit until Seth was born. And then they said, hey, you know, we need to return to what Adam taught us and what We've been taught. And so he, they started saying, we are sons of God. No, we are not sons of our own selves. We, we don't have our own ways. And I hope you think that way. You think that, hey, you know what? I, yes, I've been, doing, I've been doing this and this in my life. Yes, I, I think I like this and I like that. But you've got to question yourself. If I'm a son or a daughter of God, am I, am I really behaving in a way that would bring... God glory. And by the way, if you want to see that term exemp ex uh, you know, exemplified again, you can go to John chapter 1, verses 12. It's almost like a Bible study today. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 1, verses 12. Which says, but as many as have received him, this is what the sons of Seth did. As many as have received him, have you received Jesus Christ today? To them gave he power to become what? This is the term again. Sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. 
So those who believe and receive Christ, what you're essentially becoming, even though you may not vocal, vocalize it, is you're becoming a, sons of God, a son of God. And that's what happened to this generation. And so chapter six of Genesis assumes that you know that, that you are the sons of God are those who call upon the Lord and are more in tune with his ways and they're starting to do certain things. And then it goes on to say, they started gazing at the daughters of men. What does that mean? When, they do, when those daughters of God? No, that means that instead of looking to women who, are, who belong in the faith, they started looking at women who are outside the faith. Now, who are these? These are daughters of Cain. You know, remember when Cain left this, uh, what left Adam's place? He went out there and he took, and he 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 had his own children. And every every time uh, Seth had a son, the name would be similar in on on Seth's side. So there was a counterpart. So so they started looking at. They started looking at the daughters of men and they started mingling. And then we're told that there were giants in the earth in those days. Now, here's what I'd say. I take liberty here because I can see that obviously we know that Adam was a giant. It's interesting. Adam was a giant. And, and it's important for us to look at things from, from this perspective and then we'll spiritualize and see what happens. He said, Adam was a giant because he was made from the hand of God. Uh, beloved, I believe that even children born of those people who believed in God had a more powerful st stature than others. You know, we're told Adam had Seth at age 130. And notice that when we, uh, when we, read, we read chapter six of Genesis, before the sons of God started gazing at the daughters of men, they would have children at age 105, 120. Look at the genealogy before that. So these were men that were strong, even in physique, they were strong in, in how they were made because they had God's blessings because they were to live a long time. But when they made that mistake and they mingled with those who didn't believe in God, God takes them back, makes them into children again, he says, uh -uh, something's going to happen here. First of all, I have these men who are very strong, and all of a sudden now they've given, uh, they've given their strength to these women, and now they are having children who don't believe in me, and they have all these faculties, mental faculties, phys physical faculties. I can only let them live to a childlike age of 120, the age which at which most men at that time would, st would start to have children. So you can see that. So he, because now when they started giving, and, and here's another a sister text that I think that is important for us to read. Proverbs chapter 31, verse three. Be, lest you think this is about physical strength. Uh, child of God, son of God, daughter of God. When you stop, when you take God's ways and you think, oh, you know what? This is how I am raised and I've heard it all, but you know what? I want to try something different. Um, something happens. Something happens. The, the enemy pounces on you quicker than he would pounce on someone who doesn't know because he knows that uh, there's so much strength that could be uh, uh, taken away from you. Listen, there's many people who you could impact in your life. And he doesn't want that. So the minute he sees you start to slip, then he thinks, okay, let me do this. Also, uh, Proverbs 31, verse three, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroys kings. So when God is saying that, he, he's not saying that women are bad, but he's saying, you know what? Um, if you're a godly person and you decide to move out and go out and, and, and be with someone who doesn't regard God's ways, eventually you're gonna be corrupted. All you have to do is look at Solomon's story, uh, look at uh, many other stories. And by the way, lest you think this applies only to women, it, it, it applies to men being corrupted. 
Men can also corrupt women. How many times do we know that? There's a close relative telling you a story, a real life story, uh, who, uh, who was like uh, very close to me one time. Uh, and one time uh, we, we, had, we, 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 we were married and then this relative was living with us. And a uh, young lady, all of a sudden, she told us that there was this gentleman that had come to visit from a different country. And we were puzzled because we said, well, they come to visit, are they here? They said, yeah, they're not too far from where we live. So I kind of thought, okay, well, I need to see him. And at first I was seething because I kind of thought, wow, this person doesn't know that this is a risk. Uh, we're trying to teach this person God's ways. And then all of a sudden someone's showing up from nowhere. We don't even know what he believes. And uh, we went over there. At least I went over to the place where he was and he'd rented a place not too far from where we were. And so naturally I kind of thought, well, I have to protect this young lady. So I took down his phone number, found out everything I found out about him because I can't, I can't dictate what the young lady would do. She was of age, she could do whatever she chose, but I was careful. The man was not happy. And I almost wanted to go back and rage to the young lady that how she shouldn't this and that. Then I kind of thought, well, maybe there's a better way to do this. So I told my wife, let's do this, prepare a sumptuous meal. Instead of me getting angry, the Lord inspired me. And I said, well, in, uh, prepare a sumptuous meal and have the gentleman come in. And uh, suffice to say, uh, we did invite him. He did come over. And uh, he was almost twice the age of this young lady. Uh, and uh, so we, we had no prejudice. We invited him, he came over and he was excited and delighted because he kind of thought, well, if they accept me here, then uh, I'm in good company now. I, I'm able to get what I want. And so he naturally now just went on to tell me all kinds of stories and he was talking all the time. As he talked, the more he talked, the more I realized, wow, this young lady is in big trouble because he talked about wife number one, wife number two, wife number three, and wife number four. And I was sitting there almost depressed, but I, I, I just went along with it. Then I thought, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing inviting this man in here, you know. But anyway, let's just have the meal and have him go away. So he went away and I said, Lord, maybe I'm going to have to pray about this. And uh, what happened was, what happened was, when I was about to go to bed, I didn't say anything because I was dumbfounded. So um, he he left and she, when I was about to go, he, he, I heard John, John, the young lady called me and said, because you guys are my spiritual mentors, I, I really wanna know what you think. I said, uh, I don't know what to tell you, but I really think, I, I don't know what to tell you because you're gonna do what you want. But my only question to you is this, what wife number do you wanna be? Something is wrong there. What wife number do you want to be? Sometimes, and I'm speaking to the young people today and even those who are of age, sometimes when the Lord says, stick to those that love me and even make associations with those who, who have a great regard for me. He is saying that for a good reason because you don't want to find out three, four, five years down the road when things have gone you know, all, all crazy. And I'm pretty sure you want to know what happened. That spoke volumes to the young lady. And uh, she went ahead and, and, and dropped that and ended up being married by a Christian man that she, whom she's with to this very day. So I'm just saying that it is not only for young men to be um, sidetracked by young women or by women who are not believers. It can be young women or women who maybe this message is for someone on many fronts, on the spiritual front. And by the way, when the Bible does talk about women, it does talk about them uh, in the sense that 
in, 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 a phys, in, a, in, in the true physical sense, uh, you know, when you talk about physiology, there's a man and there's a woman and there's warnings there and, and there's admonitions there. But on another front, you may also have a spiritual admonitions there uh, because you, you find Jeremiah saying this, that God, when he looks, when he's, he, he looks at a group of people or his own nation, uh, when I'm looking at verse two of Jeremiah chapter six, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. You see that? A comely and delicate woman. So he has done that. And then in verse seven, um, you know, he says, as a fountain casteth out her waters, so she has cast out her wickedness. Violence and spoil is heard in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. So he does look at his people as a, as, as, as a woman. So, or as a, you know, so in the Bible, the Bible, the, the, you know, a woman may represent a church, a pure one, and most of you who've been studying the prophecy, and one that is defiled. You see, and then he uses that theme constantly. In the book of Hosea, for instance, he had Hosea marry a woman who was a harlot and she kept leaving him and doing whatever she wanted. And Hosea, according to what God would tell him, go get her. And he would go get her and bring her back. And she would do it again. And at the end of the book of Hosea, it's a few chapters, you go read it. God said, likens it, he says, you know, that's what the children of Israel are, are like to me. That means they're always going out there and doing that. I hope you're not like that spiritually. Today, you love the Lord. And then the next minute, you're, you're, you're meddling with things that you know you ought not to. And even though the effects of what you're messing with may not be seen right away, they will come out eventually. It never fails. It never fails. So the Lord is saying, hey, you know what? Stop gazing at the wrong thing because that's what happened. When the men of, of uh, the sons of God gazed at the wrong women, all these uh, children were born who had no standard of righteousness. And because, because of that, all kinds of evil started uh, creeping up and going on around. Now, you, if you think about um, a man who had no good taste, who had no good taste, we, we can only think of, of Samson. And, and you think about what was at stake because you think, oh, it's just him. He went out and messed out with a lot of women. But it, it's also important for, him, for, for us to look at his life uh, and understand that um, he started off by mingling with other people. He didn't start off just liking the women. He started uh, hanging out with people who are ungodly. You know, we can kind of tend to justify things sometimes when we say, hey, you know what? I'm trying to reach them. Let me ask you something. Let, or let me make this statement. If the people you're hanging out with are constantly re ridiculing God, or every time you talk about God, it's like a big joke, and there's more of them, and they're not stopping what they're doing, and none of them is, then maybe you're in the wrong crowd. You know? and you end up being pulled into doing this or that, then maybe you should step away from that because you, you, you don't have the strength to pull yourself out of that. Listen to what this, the, 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 the uh, spirit of prophecy says about Sam, Sam, Samson's life. So, uh, had Samson obeyed the divine commands as his parents had done, he would have been nobler and hap, uh, have had, had been nobler and happier, having a ha nobler and happier destiny. But association with idolaters corrupted him. The town of Zora being near the, uh, the country of the Philistines, Samson, uh, Samson came to mingle with them on, a on friendly terms. Thus in his youth, intimacies sprung up, the influences of, of which darkened his whole life. You notice that? So first of all, you hang out with folk. Then before you know it, you're talking like them, trying to be like them to feel comfortable around them. The second thing, before you know it, you're, you're starting to like some things that they like that may not be, you know, that will, will corrupt you. Whatever it is, it, you, know, you know, women may be the general term, but it may, you know what it is to you, what it may be. But there's hope, okay? There's hope. So one of the things that, um, that we've looked at there is that you've got to understand there was a lot at stake. 
whenever a child of God falls, there's a group of people that should be following you, including maybe younger sisters, brothers, or maybe even uh, uh, people who you're an older brother or an older sister too. And so those are people that you're responsible for. Because remember, Samson was a judge and he defended Israel against its enemies, right? Uh, he did. So he wasn't just him falling. There was a whole lot of people that depended on him. So now that was gazing at the wrong thing uh, from a man point of view. Now here's another one found in Genesis chapter 14, Lot's wife gazing at worldliness. Genesis chapter 14 is where we're going to kind of start because uh, actually it should go. Um, uh, I, I wanted us to start um, in chapter 14, verse, verses 10 to see where it started, where it started. Gaze, gazing. Genesis chapter 14, verses 10. And Lord, and Lord lifted up his eyes, right? And beheld all the plain of Jordan. This is before he moved to Sodom. That it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. He tells you Sodom was a beautiful place. Today, they say it's under the Red Sea. I don't know if you've seen any documentaries on it. Uh, it looks like there's all salt because of all the sulfur that burned the place up. Um, Ryan Wyatt did uh, some kind of documentary on it. Uh, and you think about, it says it was so great. And, and it compares it to Egypt because Egypt had the... Uh, the, the Nile and the Shadouf, they, 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 well, they, they pumped water from the, from the Nile and they irrigated all the surrounding areas and it was very green. And so it, it tells us that uh, uh, that area of Sodom and Gomorrah in the plain was very wealthy and nice and luscious and good. Kind of like what Israel was in the days of Ahab as, as uh, Elijah was walking up to pronounce judgments on it. Understand this. As he was proclaiming to pronounce judgments on, on, uh, on Israel, as he walked through the country, uh, there was the beautiful verdure of greenery everywhere. And he was going to proclaim to the king that there would be a drought for three and a half years. Something that wasn't visible when looking around. So sometimes even... Uh, associations that we highly regard. We highly regard associations that seems like they've made it. And we think, well, they don't seem like they have a want for anything. That is for a time. That is for a time, you know, it's lingering and God is long suffering. You may ask yourself, how, how is it that there are men who flourish and they don't have a care about God? Well, God is long suffering. You know, you think about uh, Hebrews 12, that tells us all these, you know, talking about the faithful hall of fame in 11, in, 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 in the whole of chapter 11, died without not receiving the promise. Why did they die without not receiving the promise? So that they may wait for us. So even we are going through some kind of suffering today so that we may wait for those who think that reveling in this world's uh, riches is, 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 is is, is, some, is their right and they don't have to care for God. God is waiting for them and, and allowing us to suffer the, the difficulties of this life so that they may at one time turn around and, and join us and together we would be with them, right? So the gaze was on such things, you know, but they started right there in Genesis chapter uh, 14 verses 10 and he really co coveted uh, the, the riches of Sodom based on what he could see. Remember, the Lord doesn't look on the outside. He looks at the heart. Huh? First Kings chapter, I think, uh, I think I lost the address on that. But remember that when he, uh, when Samuel went to anoint David uh, and, uh, and, and, and Samuel saw uh, David's brothers, he looked on the outside and he was very impressed by their stature. And God told him, I've rejected that one and that one and that one. I look at the heart. So we ought not to be so caught up in what we see, the sensual things, even the things that we want to get. Uh, sleep on things. Sleep on things. Things that you think you need. Sleep on them. And when I say sleep on them, that means we get, set aside time to pray. 
so that you know you may not make a mistake, even though it looks so obvious, so that you don't get caught up in the wrong thing. You don't get caught up in a snare. So Lot's wife gazed and she did gaze. Oh, did she gaze, right? So by the time he, Lot got in there, if you read Genesis chapter 14, I'm not gonna go through it all. If you read Genesis chapter 14, she was still gay, you know, they, they, he, he, got, he got so caught up in it. He said, well, yeah, let's go build our own house over there, you know, and have a wonderful time there. And so they went there. And by chapter 14, when, when Sodom had its woes, when they got attacked by other kings, Lot had to be captured. Now, here's the message here for that. Lot was captured the first time. And, and Abraham had to come save him. And, and had to rescue him. See, when you're in a precarious situation, uh, brothers and sisters, because God doesn't just let you perish if you're his child. He may send warnings of others and he may tell you, you know what, this looks good now. Come on, man, let's get out. You, you need to leave this alone. You ought to consider that. If you are hooked on something, guess what? God can help you overcome it. But don't fight it and act like, how you dare tell me that and this and that. You're fighting. Say, you know, take that into account and say, you know what? The enemy has got me over here. I'm, I'm, I'm ensnared by a certain situation here. Let me consider what they're saying. They, my gaze is on the wrong thing. And, you know, when your brother and sister tells you, man, you've been watching that movie. Uh, doesn't look very Christian to me. Don't be like, oh, you and your your self-righteousness, you know, you throw that back at them and maybe they're telling you something before it gets too far down the line. The gaze, your gaze. Let it not be Lot's wife's gaze because we know the story of Lot's wife because at the very end, when Lot, after they, they had, they suffered that, uh, by the time you get to Genesis 18, the three angels show up in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in Mamre, and they find, they find Abraham there and God says, shall I hide Abraham whom I know that loves me? I shall tell him what I'm gonna do. And by this time, when he tells, when he, God tells Abraham, listen, this is interesting. He tells Abraham he's gonna destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham starts pleading for the people. He's actually praying. It's kind of like now you've got to the, to the point where you've told your friend Lot, hey, man, you know, you got to get out of that neighborhood. You, you, you know, those folks are corrupting you. And now you can't even talk to that, your friend anymore because you know he's not going to listen. So now you're saying, Lord, just do something to him and, and, or her and, and get, get out of there. You see that? Get out of there, please. You, and now he can't even talk to Lot. Because Lot is, you know, has vacillated so much, he's in there. And by the time now, as they're praying, and you know the rest of the story, by the time Lot's wife gets out of Sodom, it's so hard even to pull her mind out of it that she becomes a pillar of salt out there. These are less life's lessons right now, brothers and sisters, of, of things that we ought to uh, kind of keep our minds off of and, and how to want our, our brothers and sisters. Now, I wanted us to go to another type of gazing because this is a, a gazing that all of us experience. And it's found in the book of uh, John chapter five. And this is the kind of gazing that you would call gazing at problems, gazing at problems gazing at problems. I'm not going to be very long today. I don't know how long I've been so far. You know, I'm not going to be very long. I, I want it to be short and sweet so that we all can get it. In fact, some of the scriptures I've said, let's, let, let, I'll have you go read. Go read uh, Genesis chapter 14 all the way to 18 and put yourself in Lot's shoes. Don't put yourself in Abraham's shoes because we always like to play. We like the righteous guy, don't we? Right? So uh, what did I give you, John? Chapter 5. John chapter five, gazing at problems or looking, yeah, gazing at problems. There's a character here. Um, after, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. See that? 
well, I, I guess I'm rushing too far ahead. Wait for people to catch up, right? After this, now there at Jerusalem at the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. It's giving you the place. The Bible is interesting because sometimes it tells you, hey, you know what, there's a place here. And obviously now that has five porches and this is, there was, it was a particular day. This is something that really happened. Uh, you know, this is where it was. And sometimes they do all those excavations. They find the five pillars where that was uh, by the ship market pool, exactly where it was. And then they tell you, in this lay a great multitude of impotent folk. That tells you there's a lot of impotent folk that were there at that particular time of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. I've heard it said that this particular place, a lot of people had some, a lot of superstitions about this particular place where you, you find that they believe, according to verse four, that an, an angel would, would go down uh, at a certain season in, into the pool. You see that? And trouble the water, kind of sh shake you know, the water. So now the first person that would be in the pool right after the water was, was you know, whatever the, the angel did, I don't know if he dropped a coin or whatever, when there was a little ripple in the water, you had to be right in there in order to be healed. Now, if, if, if you couldn't run fast enough, or if you couldn't see where you were going, you could be running out into the field, thinking that, you know, this aid ripped, and then you're running, and you say, you're going the wrong way, and it's that kind of thing. But see, the odds were stacked up against you. Now, many of us face challenges. I don't know what your challenge is, is today. And you can imagine if you are impotent, at least we know that this man was not, was not, he could see. So he was, he was looking to see if the water would ripple. So he was actually gazing, don't you think? He was gazing and saying, man, I can't wait until, maybe this is how my help will come. You know, and David did say one time, like, I look up to the mountains from whence my help comes. This, sometimes we go through situations and we dwell on them and we're thinking, man, I want this situation to be over with. Man, I'm going through so much trouble. I, you know, I'm waiting for this, this solution and it needs to be like this in order for it to fix my problems. And you're gazing. And you're gazing. And uh, notice what he does. What, what he does uh, when, when Jesus approaches him because he knew. He'd been there for 38 years, my friend. So you can imagine. So that was a problem. But he was expecting an exact solution for God to do a certain thing. Kind of like... Elijah expected a specific solution when he, when the fire came down from heaven, he thought the hearts of every man and woman in Israel would be converted. When they were not, he ran and ran. And then God approaches him in the cave and there was thunder. God was not in the thunder. Remember that? And then, uh, you know, then there was a big, you know, lightning or whatever it was. He, God was not in that. And then he heard a little whisper. And then he covered himself in the cloak because he was surprised at how God spoke to him. So now you're thinking when you're looking at your situation, man, you know, I need this such and such and such. And because of your thinking and your gaze and your steadfastness in one direction, you don't think that God can work in a different way. I like the quote that George likes to, uh, Elder George likes to quote. He says, God has a thousand ways to provide for those who love him, yet we don't know. Yet we, are we fix our gaze on one thing. Learn not to do that. Lean not on your own understanding. Learn to stop doing that. And you know what, folks? And, and if, if, if you find yourself worrying too much about a particular thing, especially during your free time, find yourself something to do. You know, misery loves company, especially when you're sitting down idle and not doing anything. The devil's workshop. Find something to do and ask God to give you something busy so that you're not worried about it, uh, so that even eventually through that situation, God will help, help you not even think about it. And when he blesses you, you're going to be like, oh, wow, I completely forgot about this problem. Your character will be developed. Because when Jesus shows up and starts to ask him a question, he says, will thou be made whole in verse 6? The man is not even ready for it. 
He's not even ready for it. What does he start to say? You know, I was expecting my solution to be fixed this way. Look, the impotent man asked him, sir, I have no man. See, <laughs> to, uh, I have no man where the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. You see, everybody is better than me. Everybody's problems gets fixed. And the more you do that, you're going to be there for another year, uh, 38 years. As long as you're complaining, and I am saying that how come so and so such a thing works well, mine doesn't, and that, those are your prayers. I, why, why can't you do for me like you do for him? Your solution is not the other person's solution. It's not. It's not. All right. Then there's gazing at Jesus, the last type of gazing. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Verses 10 and 11. And you know, this is after the resurrection. And when he had spoken these things, and while they beheld, he was taken up, talking about Jesus. And a cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly, they were looking up, I would suppose, steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye doing what? Gazing up into heaven. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Why are you standing up there? It's almost like you're standing up here waiting for him to come back or whatever, whatever you're doing. You know he's gone up. He told you he's gone up. And you're standing there and you're staring. He will come back. But what did they do when they saw he was going up? He had talked so much about going up. Now they get it. They go back to the upper room and they start getting ready. They start getting ready, not for his coming back, of getting others ready. They stop gazing at themselves, at their problems, at others, at worldliness. At, 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 at strange doctrines, at they stopped gazing at rebellion. They stopped all that. And they started to realize, you know, we have to get ourselves ready. Now, I have to warn you, uh, brothers and sisters, we have a tendency to gaze at the wrong thing. COVID struck and all of you got paralyzed. And sometimes you get paralyzed. Even when we, we, we're going through this whole thing and you're worried about what next bad thing will happen. They were like that. The disciples were like that. When Jesus was, was killed, Peter and, and, and John and all of them, they were hiding. That's kind of what we did. You were like, uh, you know, now they're going to do this. The government is going to do this. And it's going to do that. And it's going to do that. Instead of saying, Lord, the, your time is about to come where you're returning. And we haven't got men and women ready. And we're not ready. Uh, if I have ought against anybody, Lord, let's get that out of the way so that you can, your Holy Spirit can maybe pour down instead of me gazing at all these other things so that I may be able to go out and help and do, and do the work that you have me do. Help me to stop gazing and, and help me to stop complaining. Because, you know, if you want to get an idea of where they were, uh, Paul's writing kind of gives us an idea because he was a persecutor. He was the persecutor before he was converted. And in the book of Corinthians, he says, shall death, what shall separate us from the love of God? From doing God's work. Is, is, is COVID going to separate you? By the way, stop gazing at that TV every time they have a new report. You know, unless they're telling you some new information, you know it already. Don't stop gazing at it to where you're, you're paralyzed in fear. The, the, you know, the, the, the lion actually roars, you know, and, and we're told, you know that the lion has a, um, a vocal cords like a slingshot? The, 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 the vocal cords swing all the way down. And, and then when it releases, the roar is, is, is so paralyzing. It's done, it's like that for a reason. 
so that it doesn't have to do most of the work. If you're so fearful and paralyzed, he just comes out and picks you up if, if you're his prey. Now, if you are so paralyzed and you're eating food, you're buying toilet paper, like when everybody else is buying toilet paper, uh, all the kids are in, in, in your home are so scared. We can tell sometimes, everybody's scared. Uh, what are you gonna do when, when the, in, in the swelling of the Jordan, when other things come and earthquakes hit and all that? Ask, let's ask God for courage and stop gazing at problems that are still gonna come more and more and more and more. Let's ask God for courage that we may do that which he's asking us to do and that keep doing what he, to tell him to send you souls or whatever it is that we, we can hear some of you, God is helping you do that and God be praised for that. But let's not gaze at problems and let's not gaze at, at the wrong things. I, I know we've covered a lot of ground and, and I hate to keep belabor this, but the Lord is soon to come. And oftentimes we get caught up in the wrong things. And that's why there's some of these sermons kind of help us to uh, bring us back to where he is. Now, the, the man who was by the pool, was he healed? Yes, he was. God understands you're weak and you've been gazing at the wrong things, but he wants to heal. And so if you have, and if you've been scared, you know, running scared, ask him. Tell him, I, I don't know what the solution to my problem is. I don't know why I'm into this kind of situation, but pull me out, please. He will. He will. You know, and, I, and I'll keep it simple and end it right there. And uh, maybe ask Elder George to close us out in prayer. Amen. We can't hear you, George. Yeah. I, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was a wonderful, wonderful message. Um, of encouragement to the people to, to focus on the right thing. And certainly it's a reminder for us all. Um, I trust that you have been blessed uh, today uh, by what was shared. Uh, we want you to be strengthened. Uh, we don't want you to be afraid. The words of Jesus are, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And I believe that he had also this uh, time that we're living in, in mind. Uh, nothing was exempted. Everything was included. Uh, and now, my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he give you peace. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness and for your mercy. For coming to speak to us, dear Lord, thank you, dear Lord, that Father, you are still high and lifted up and above all the distractions of the earth. Lord, you sit enthroned and everything, all things are open to your divine survey. And from your great and calm eternity, we're told that you order that which your providence sees best for us. We thank you. We thank you so much, dear Lord. We thank you that there is nothing impossible with you. We thank you, dear Lord, that there is nothing hid from your sight, that all, that all things are open. As the Bible tells us, there's nothing. All things are naked unto the eyes of whom, him with whom we have to do. And now, Lord, we are your children, your servants. We've heard your word. And we would like, Father, for it to be a, a, to us, to us, according to what has been spoken. We don't want to be fearful. Lord, we want to be strong. And for that reason, we ask for grace and your spirit sufficient for the rest of the way. Help us, Lord, instead of looking, as we were just told, uh, at the things around about us that are taking place that are paralyzing, dear Lord, those who are looking and are fulfilling the word of the Lord, which he spake saying that men's hearts will fail them for fear for looking at those things which are coming upon the earth. As your children, dear Lord, I pray and ask you, help us to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried to the midst of the ocean, Lord, help us to be among those who do not fear, because the Lord is our strength. Because even though we walk through the, uh, the, the, the fire, Lord, help us to remember that we will not be burned. And even through the waters, that the waters will not cover us because we are your children. Thank you so very much. We ask that you bless each and every person, Lord. Bless especially 
those who are sick. I ask, Lord, that you would heal them. I lift up, dear Lord, Elisa, this morning. I lift up uh, her uh, uh, daughter. I lift up her granddaughter, Elisa. And Father, I ask especially, Lord, that um, Father, as they are, are at home recuperating, I ask, Lord, that uh, through this thing, that you would show yourself strong and that you would glorify yourself Dear Lord, even in this, dear Lord, and show yourself greater than all. I pray, Lord, for also for my sister-in-law, uh, who also uh, told me she has COVID. And uh, I pray, Father, and ask, Father, that you would especially protect her, protect the children, protect her husband, dear Lord, so that they don't get it. Father, I pray that you work with the simple remedies that they are using, Father. And I claim the promise for them found in, in, the, in Chronicles 16, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward him. I pray, dear Lord, that as that you forgive them their sins, Lord, so that, Father, you may hear from heaven and forgive and then heal. We believe that you are still God who forgives all of our iniquities and heals all of our diseases. And I ask that you would do that. Father, I pray, dear Lord, for each and every person here, Lord, that is listening, that is uh, present in church today. I ask, Lord, for a special blessing for them. And, uh, Lord, if there is anything, not if, Lord, there are things, dear Lord, that people are in need of. Lord, uh, I pray, Father, that you would hear the prayer of such a one and that you would reveal yourself to be the great I am and provide, dear Lord, whatever it is they need. We thank you, we praise you, and we exalt you. In the wonderful name of your Son and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Oh, yeah. I hear Lisa. Yeah. Praise, praise God. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm not sure why it seems that there were, the, uh, our uh, attendance today was uh, less than I've seen it. Usually we are... Um, page and another page i see just one page today i think it's because there's families congregating are there families congregating together yes i see uh, the Benson Carmina. family there yeah. armina okay yeah that's good that's good we encourage that as much as possible uh that mm -hmm. people can uh, and uh you don't know. see the spakes i think the spakes because mm -hmm. they're at justin's i think oh are they at justin's announce yourself spakes Or she was. We are here. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 Hey. All right. It's the, it's just the under shepherds here wondering where the, all the sheep all the sheep are. That that's all. We found the missing sheep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and where's my sister? We'll have the afternoon session to, to this afternoon. Oh, right. excellent. Uh, hey, Alvin, uh, are you still married to my sister? All right, there she is. Okay, just making sure. Are okay. you guys cold? I